Hello and welcome to another week of the Promax Asia webinar. We are happy to have the James and Wilkinson media team with us today, specialized in TV marketing and media planning. They are going to show you how you can access the hell of your promotional strategy. If you haven't downloaded the assessment worksheet, you can find the link to do that now at the chat section. And if you have any question that you'd like to ask them, you can put them down in the Q&A section or upvote the question that is already there. And they, will take, and they will answer them at the end. You can find the chat and Q&A sections at the bottom of your Zoom window. Joining us now all the way from London is Alan James and Joe Wilkinson. And from Singapore, Joe Godard, just the JWM team. Over to you guys. Hello and um, welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon's webinar. The three of us are absolutely delighted to be uh, joining the Promax Asia uh, community in the Promax India community today and I'm just going to bring the slides up um, and as you will all know as you registered for the webinar today's theme is very much around your TV marketing strategy we all have one in place um, but actually having an opportunity to give it a quick health check over the next hour to make sure it's working for you it's fit for purpose for what you need to achieve for your channels and services and platforms for today, but also starting to think about, okay, what does it need to look like in the future, whether that's in one year's time or in five years time. Um, so we're gonna be doing sort of a more practical session, which is a bit diff different from um, previous webinars that Promax have done over the last few weeks. Um, we're gonna do some exercises um, that will hopefully give something for everyone that's joining us today. Um, it might be that you're in a situation where there's a lot of change in your organization, so you need a little bit more clarity of thinking about where to focus and what you should be doing more of in terms of your marketing. It might be that actually, I think we're pretty robust, but I just want to have a sort of tick box exercise to make sure that my strategy is on the right path. Or it may be something that I very much resonate from my experiences working in TV broadcasting at BBC and Sky previously. Um, you get very busy doing the doing, if you like, and managing the day to day that quite often you don't really have the time to stop and think about, OK, what does my marketing look like as an entirety? Is the focus I'm giving it and the perception from audiences the right one I need to address my business challenges for today and also my business challenges for the future? Um, and our mission um, is very much about making TV marketing better and I'm sure everyone that's joining us today very much wants to do that with their own TV marketing. This is at the heart of every project that we do. But there are obviously lots of ingredients that go into making TV marketing better. Creative is an essential part of that, um, but just as important is that marketing strategy, that effective promotional um, strategy that allows you to make sure that you're using that significant owned media and any paid media that you have at your fingertips to really build the communication and the right communication with audiences, the right mix of messages to make sure you can sustain a, a successful business in what is actually at the moment a very disruptive landscape that we're all working in. So in essence, it's about combining that art of marketing with the science of, of media and audiences. Um, and the reason why we're sort of saying let's take some time out today to just to do this health check is um, we are all living through a dramatic period of change over the last three to four years in, in the broadcast world. Uh, audiences are changing the way they consume. We've got lots more players in the market. Um, and what was working for us maybe last year or two years ago may not necessarily be the right ingredients for what we need to do to make sure we have successful businesses for the future. And I hopefully this, this sort of image here, this graphic, I think is very simple and powerful, but almost shows the way that we are in a 24 seven business and we're just busy, busy managing campaigns on a day-to-day -day basis um, and reacting and see that peaks and troughs there and maybe firefighting as well. Whereas how often do we get to sit down and actually think about the future? And we're big advocates about not just planning for the future, but why not plan the future? In other words, put yourself into your shoes five years from now, assuming you're still in the same role. What does that look like? What does your business look like? What are your services that you want to offer? What are your audiences and your content? So what does your marketing need to evolve to over the next five years? 
And that change you need to create, you need to think about that change today in order to get there tomorrow. Um, and I'm sure some of you feel that marketing is under increasing pressure to fulfill so many more demands across the business than ever before. You may be becoming a bigger business. You now have new platforms in the mix. You need to serve the needs of lots of different audiences who are becoming maybe more and more fragmented across your platforms. And these are two sort of at a very top level, two examples of the tasks that we may want to achieve in our marketing. So very much about now, we want audiences to, to consume our content, drive tune in if it's a linear channel, maximize viewing and maintain your share in the market. But there's also that pressure on us about, okay, well, how do we need to plan for the future and address the ever-changing needs of that market? And how much is your marketing now focusing on doing that, that job on the left-hand side of the screen versus the right-hand side of the screen? What should the balance be? And what will that look like in five years from now? And so these are sort of some of the questions that we want to sort of pose today and to take you through some simple, but what we feel are effective exercises to help you sort of build some, give you some clarity, give you some ideas, maybe help to think about, okay, how I might need to change some things in my marketing, the marketing mix, what I support, um, and how to think how that strategy may evolve over the next uh, couple of years. And when it comes to the role of marketing of content, um, I know from my own experiences that everyone has an opinion on what, what you should be doing. And you, from a marketing point of view, you may be selecting content that's important to prioritize um, because it has a, 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 a good brand fit versus other content. Um, particularly if your um, revenue comes in from advertising, then you will have a very powerful sort of internal team from airtime sales talking about, okay, well you, the content that's important for us is stuff that brings in high viewing and then programming again may have a different perspective. And when it comes to sort of all these opinions focusing on our marketing, sometimes it adds confusion um, to what you do and disruption to your activities. And you look back and you think, okay, what have I done? What's all my marketing look like over the last 12 months? And it might be a very different picture to what you originally planned it to do. So, um, so just to talk about today, hopefully what we're gonna do is give you some exercises that are gonna help you through this journey. All you need today is your brain, okay? And um, particularly, I, for those joining us from Asia, it's obviously towards the end of the day, so I hope that's still functioning okay. And some of you may have downloaded some worksheets, um, which you would have got as part of the registration to the webinar. If you got those, brilliant. If you haven't, do not worry. All you need is pen and paper. Okay, it's very, very simple, the exercises we're gonna do, and you can just jot them down on a piece of paper. Um, so the four exercises we're going to focus on are going to come from different angles. We're going to be thinking about what your revenue streams, your content, your brands and audiences, and they should work no matter what type of organization you're in, whether we're talking about linear channels, non-linear channels, TV, VOD. And the idea really is to, over these exercises, to tease out things that you might want to think differently about or things that you might want to do more of and what you might want to do less of as you move forward in your marketing strategy. And this is all about ensuring that both your current and future success um, is about bringing audiences into your content and driving that revenue. Okay, so let's go into the exercises. I will say if anyone has any questions at any point um, while we're going the, in, doing the exercises, then um, Joe Goddard is on hand to pick up those questions. If just pop them in the Q&A um, and, and he will respond to them as we go through. If you've got questions which are generally about promotion strategy, then that, they will come to those right at the end. So let's just do questions about the exercises as we go through and then actual general questions we can answer at the end of the webinar. And we really, we really encourage you to, to ask questions and, and, and feel free to ask as many questions as you like because then we can get the more the exercises working between us all. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the first exercise we're going to do is called drivers of promotional strategy. And this is more thinking about the bigger picture. What are the things that are going to drive your promotional strategy and make it successful? So identifying the current areas of focus and the future areas of focus. Um, and there's four of these. Um, pretty obvious, not the, they are um, revenue, audiences, content and brand. 
okay and we're going to go through each one of these and so if you um, have got the worksheet for this in front of you brilliant if not if you've got a piece of paper just write down revenue audiences content and brand and we're going to ask a question against each of these so and then I'll, I'll focus on each one and then if you just spend a minute or so just answering how that applies to you your organization your channels or your portfolio okay so if you think firstly about revenue, obviously it's the most critical thing within a business. Um, but the question we really want to answer is, how will your revenue streams change over time? And answering this question is, is really crucial because it, you really have to identify how you use your marketing resource, whether that's your own media, your paid media, and also your creative resource, how much should you be focusing it, uh, that on different parts of your organization? Um, for many of you, advertising is probably a key revenue source. How is that going to change over time? If, if, if advertising remains important now and in one to two to three to four, five years time, then you need to think a bit deeper then, okay, well, where is that advertising revenue going to come from? Which services, platforms or products are going to be key for driving your revenue now? And how are these going to change in the future? So do you just want to spend just, just one minute just quickly noting down your thoughts on how your revenue streams are going to change? Um, and then we'll move on to the next one. And while you do that, I'll just sort of talk about uh, an example of, a, a, a well, I guess a lot of broadcasters are really dealing with that shift from working with linear channels to launching maybe their digital products and how in the future that so much more of their revenue may come from their digital products. And so the reason we're asking this question is that really helps to focus how I need to evolve my marketing strategy over the next one to five years in order to drive up the success of those digital products in the future. Uh, we worked recently with a broadcaster that two years ago was predominantly um, in the linear pay business. Um, so it had a foot in revenues from affiliates and from advertising. It's now over the last two years through acquisition of lots of channels now become a predominantly what we call the free to air business. So advertising revenue really is the core of what they, um, how they're generating their revenue now. And now they're starting to put their foot into some direct to consumer products um, in terms of AVOD and SVOD as well. So for them, how they use their marketing resources really shifted over the last two years and will continue to do so because they got to drive up and push audiences to those digital platforms in order for them to become viable for the future. Okay, so hopefully everyone's managed to write something down about, about their revenue and start to think, okay, how is that changing? The next question, audiences. So who should your audiences be? And think of this as two answers. One, who are they now? And who do they need to be in the future? And when I talk about the future, I'm not talking next year, I'm talking in three, four, five years time. Okay. And you may have a number of different audience segments that are important to you. So then it's about okay, knowing which ones you need to retain and they will continue to be important to you. Others you might need to grow in order to remain successful in the future. And there'll be others that maybe are important to you now, but maybe less so in the future. And even if you're working on a VOD platform, again, at the moment, a lot of VOD platforms are very much at that acquisition stage, trying to grow their user base. And over time, that, that is going to change to more of a retention strategy. So how do I keep those audiences that are on my platform, keep them coming back? And again, identifying well, who are those most important viewers? So who are the heavier viewers? And um, how do you keep them into um, onto your platform and in your channels what kind of content is going to do that all helps to refine your promotional strategy joe well, can maybe you, can, sorry joe can you give us some examples of of what those audiences might look like are you talking about young and old or, or gender yeah or, or, a good or question demogra demographics? Yeah. yeah definitely so uh, particularly from uh, ad sales market some some uh, markets only monetize certain age groups uh, so we've worked recently with a broadcaster who um, they only generated revenues for audiences under the age of 50 and um, they've uh, quite a mature channel that's been well established 10 years ago 80% of their audience was under the age of 50 they've been very good at keeping that audience with them over the last 10 years but that audience has now grown 10 years older so now only half of the audience that actually watches the channel 
um, falls under the age of 50. So hence only half the audience can they now monetize. So for them, the big critical thing is actually they need to recruit audiences in at that younger end in order to, to have a successful business for the future. So their audience now might be uh, the I don't know, 18 to 49 audience and their audience for the future is still 18 to 49. But to get those 18 to 49s for the future, they need to be targeting under 35s. So for them, it was very much about, OK, we need to switch and pivot how much we're marketing content that brings in that older end of the audience. And how do we bring in that younger, lighter viewer audience into into the channel? Thank you. Okay, so hopefully you've all managed to, to um, write down some, some answers to the audience's question. So let's move on to content. Um, critically important. If you didn't have content, we wouldn't have businesses. So ask yourself and be really honest when you, when you answer this as well. So what content do you want to be known and valued for? Um, if that is currently the content that you are known and valued for, then excellent. Um, but think about that content now and what will that content be in four or five years time? Okay. Um, is there a job that needs to be done in maybe educating some audiences about your content? Uh, do you have some successful program brands that may be coming to an end? And so you're going to have maybe a year from now, maybe a bit of a lull while you have new content come in and all these depending on how you answer this you're obviously going to shape a very different promotional strategy we were on a call last week um, to a broadcaster who has very had some very successful program brands that have been established over the last four to five years but they're in quite a difficult situation because they were all actually coming to an end over the next 12 months and even though they had new content coming through the pipeline, these were completely new program brands. So for them, they completely had to pivot the way they had done their marketing traditionally, which is more about just sort of retaining, talking to those viewers that knew that content and approach it in a very different way and find new audience groups and create new, new fans. So answering that question about what do you want to be known and valued for and are you and what would that be in the future, again, might show you some gaps that you think, right, OK, I need to put more of a marketing focus on or think about how my marketing can fill this gap that I've got. Yeah, Joe, this is less about, I suppose, individual pieces of content. It's about what does your channel portfolio stand for? So what makes you different in terms of um, content from, from maybe your competitors in terms of getting that standout in terms of that channel I know delivers that? so well and and this content thing will do more exercises um shortly yeah okay and then let's move on to that fourth driver which is um brands and very much i want to focus here about perception so how are you currently perceived amongst key audiences in this that perception what you want or is there a gap there that you need to change are there and it might be you need to think about this for different audience segments there may be certain audience segments that actually that there is that you're exactly where you want them to be in terms of the perception of what you stand for as a as a brand but there may be some audience groups that you need to shift their perception um, so how much of a job is there to be done on this so just think about and write down, OK, how are you perceived amongst audiences now? Is there anything that you need to address over the next two to five years to change that perception? And which audiences could that be? Um, and I'm just trying to think of an example here of, uh, again, a call we've had in the last couple of weeks with a, with a very successful broadcaster who has a very successful video on demand platform. Um, and uh, their video on demand platform is probably sort of within the top five in their market. However, they recognize that for them to be, continue to be successful five years from now, they really had a big job to do in terms of changing the perceptions of what their video on demand platform offered. At the moment, it's very much seen as a, a destination for catch up. Um, and where they really aspire to be is almost like lot, 
like where you position Netflix, a lot of us go into Netflix not knowing what we want to watch, but just wanting to explore and know we find something there to watch. And they wanted to create that kind of mind shift, that mind shift in audiences over the next four to five years. So the way they had to approach their marketing of that platform would be very, very different from if it was just purely about driving consumption and, and just driving sort of a destination for catch up. Yeah, I think that's a great example, Joe, because obviously we're at a time now where there's there's lots of broadcasters that are sort of making that transition, aren't they, from a, li a linear brand to also having another service. So, yeah, I think it's it's helping change people's perceptions of that, that, that there is a broader portfolio out there which just isn't linear. It's also on demand as well. Okay, so hopefully you've all had enough time. It's very difficult without it being a two-way process. I had enough time to write down um, how each of these four factors are relevant and are um, impacting your organisation. And the reason for doing this, and so just to sort of bring this back, is actually thinking about, well, what does my marketing need to focus on? Are there jobs that I need to think about doing here? Over the next 10 or 12 how am I going to do things differently over the next 12 months versus what I've done for the last 12 months? What things do I need to pay maybe more attention to? And so looking at what you've written down there, maybe just circle around the, the ones that you think actually I need to be doing more of these because when we get to the end of this webinar, we're going to try and sort of pull together what you should be doing more of and maybe what you don't need to do as much of as you have done in the past. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to exercise number two. So I'm going to hand over to Alan, who's going to lead this one. Hello, everybody. Um, so we touched on brand in the last factor that Joe's just, just uh, gone through. And we probably think that brand is something that can sometimes go amiss in that 365, 24-7 uh, world that we sort of live in in the broadcast world so we probably feel that understanding your brand health is critical for future success um, particularly these days when you get such aggregated uh, content platforms where some of the smaller brands or even some of the bigger brands can sometimes be squeezed out and uh, and people the viewer doesn't actually know where that brand is coming from or who actually owns that brand so therefore getting that stamp on your brand and a recognition amongst your viewers of the ownership of that content is quite important so we basically we do a little exercise now in terms of trying to highlight where you think your brand is and we do this either by channel or portfolio or master brand or anything else um, to be able to assess exactly where we are and from that once we recognize our strengths and weaknesses we can try to address the weaknesses through your using your biggest marketing asset which is your own on-air promotion in effect and also try to exploit your strengths as well but you need to know your strengths and weaknesses of your brand positioning to be able to to do that joe can you move on to the chart please mm -hmm. so this is the second exercise okay and this is um this is a, a a an exercise that um we we, we saw tns the the major research company uh use these these labels in blue in terms of what makes an irresistible brand uh, and they actually had 10 of them for, for the purpose of this exercise we've actually reduced it down down to six and their irresistible brand it came out actually to be um to be mercedes we thought oh this is interesting let's take that uh, let's change the, some of the dynamics a little tiny bit and try to address that to what makes an irresistible broadcast brand. So if I go through these uh, in order, so if I look at alignment first, okay, alignment is basically what fulfills your channel proposition. So every channel and service you've got hopefully is underpinned in terms of a proposition of what it delivers both in turn of the, inside of the company, but more importantly to the actual viewer. We then take a look at momentum. Momentum is about innovation. So, you know, we've all seen that television in general can quite often be a mature aging product that needs internal momentum, that needs innovation as well. Where are you on that timeline as well? Emotion, we all know, is quite critical in terms of how we feel about brands, products, services as well. So do you have the content that audiences resonate with. 
do people come to you for a particular reason, a particular mood, a particular feeling? As I mentioned before, we're seeing huge amounts of content being produced now, either by linear broadcasters or OTT services. So therefore, differentiation of content is quite key. So how much unique content have you got within your particular market? Why do people come to you? All these aspects build up to a strong brand health in effect. And then the two final ones, which were slightly, uh, slightly linked, symbolism. So when I mentioned before that um, you, we've got such aggregated con platform, platforms throughout the world now inside of our broadcast worlds, you know, pe we don't want to make it too difficult for people to recognize where that content is coming from. So symbolism from a broadcast point of view, we see is, is your brand easily recognizable to that consumer? Can they immediately um, allocate a name and an understanding of where that content, where that brand actually sits. And finally, and I've already mentioned this word uh, once before, unity, and I've mentioned strong master brand. And this becomes more and more difficult, we're saying, you know, as acquisitions uh, in the broadcast world take place throughout the world, um, in terms of huge, great companies buying other huge, great companies, uh, and quite often having brands with very different um, names for a, for, for a better word and no sort of master brand above it. This becomes uh, very, very difficult. We're also seeing uh, SVOD platforms being, being launched that, um, that quite often cause additional uh, concern in this. Then again, you get something like Disney Plus launching, which obviously everybody knows the Disney there. But inside of that, you've got lots of brands as well. So therefore, how are they going to create the likes of um, their sub brands inside of that to make sure that they're fully recognized inside of Disney as well? So, so we to, normally... To, sorry, Alan, so to, to clarify, you can do this exercise at a, a channel or individual service yeah. level, or you can also do it at, at a portfolio level. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we normally do this in in a in a work group, um, and we always encourage people to do it individually. And you'd be quite amazed in terms of having two people from the same channel sometimes coming up with dramatically different results. So, what we'd like you to do is just spend two to three minutes, okay, marking your channel or your portfolio out of 10 for each one, where 10 is a hey, I'm absolutely brilliant in momentum or alignment or emotion or whatever naught meaning i really suck and i've got an awful lot of work to do here so mark each one out of 10 there's six categories so therefore uh give yourself a score out of 60 and you know we're all anonymous on this call it would be great then to get some feedback in terms of where you think you actually are if you need some clarification as to um or re-clarification as to what each of these six elements means then please drop a note to Joe and he can pick up those questions. Similarly, once you've actually created your score, so add up your six, your six circles um, and credit score, it would be brilliant if you could just maybe just drop those uh, notes to you, Joe, is that, is that what we're looking to do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Put any notes in the, um, in the Q and A and I can, yeah. uh, I can pick it up. Um, yeah. And yeah, if anyone wants to share their scores, then, then, then feel free to do so. And yeah. there isn't, there isn't, if, if, if you're, you've got low scores, it doesn't necessarily mean a negative. It's just about recognizing those different areas and then and thinking about how you want to change that in the future. And it might mm. just be because your brand isn't necessarily very innovative and that, that might be absolutely fine, but it's just about understanding what, what areas do need um, yeah. attention. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're obviously not going to name check what, 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 no. what cast of that score comes from. It'd just be good to get an idea of, yeah. of the range of different scores that, that people are. Yeah are getting on on this webinar yeah and I'll, come, I'll come back to that point it's this is about only by recognizing where you're weak and maybe and your strengths that you can then apply your promotional strategy in line with the previous exercise to try to address your weaknesses and once again to maximize your strengths why wouldn't you want to do that if you're strong in certain areas as well yeah. And, okay. and when we've done this exercise, actually, there's probably the two of these categories that come up as um, probably a bigger challenge for a lot of broadcasters is around momentum. So uh, I, I think a lot of broadcasters feel like they're then 
not as innovative as they need to be um, in this day and age. And, and innovation means lots of different things to different broadcasters. Um, but um, it might be innovation in terms of platforms, it might be innovation in terms of content, it might be just innovation in the way you talk to your audiences. Um, but yeah. we generally find that that is one that quite a lot of broadcasters find they, they, they can't, don't give themselves a top score on. Um, yeah. And I think increasingly we're seeing sort of a lot of broadcasters questioning about unique content as well. Um, yeah, di differentiation of content is quite key because obviously there's yeah. so much similar content throughout the world and and quite often you get the same content in the same markets just within a different time window. And therefore, you know, if that is the case, then there's obviously a need to better exploit any of your own content or, and this possibly links in with the innovation part, or to market it in a very different way. What is the proposition of that particular content? Um, and can you, can you differentiate yourself in terms of, uh, of, of that, that pathway. So um, I'm not sure if you've got any questions, any clarifications coming through yet, but I mean, quite often we, we do sort of, uh, once we do this in a, in a live setting, we quite often say, has anybody got a score greater than 50? And there's normally somebody who, who loves their channel, but is sometimes maybe a little tiny bit um, misled by their channel or, or by their, how much they love their job, in effect, in terms of scoring that. And it may be somebody from the same organization that has got a score down in something like sort of 20 out of 60 as well. So it would be great just to, to see what your score is and then to sort of assess it. Um, we would normally go through uh, the strong points and the weak points uh, of this exercise and, and dig a little tiny bit deeper, but that's something which we can't do at this particular stage, but hopefully you can take some learnings from that and, um, and take them back to, um, to the office. Uh, uh, hopefully that's enough time for that exercise, so um, we can possibly come back to that at the end. Joe, should we move on to the next one? Yep, okay. So the third exercise we're gonna focus on now is very quick and very simple but it can often be really enlightening. Um, and particularly if you do this exercise now, but take it back to your office and you do it as a group across different parts of the business. Um, it also can be quite a useful exercise if you're trying to get other parts of the business to align to your thinking. Um, and the idea here is, is about understanding where your marketing focus is currently and looking at the, your competitors and the context of the market and where you might want to adjust that focus. Um, so let me just explain it. Uh, so for those of you who had the chart in front of you, it's, it's, it's very easy. For those of you doing pen and paper, all you need to do is draw one vertical line um, on the left-hand side of your paper, and that vertical line is your audience focus. So at the top, it's about how much are you communicating, is you're communicating your focus against your lighter viewers, and then at the bottom is actually how much of your focus is actually um, marketing to your loyal viewers. And then you need one um, horizontal line across the bottom. And this is thinking about your business focus. So how much of your marketing is about driving viewing? So tune in Sunday at night, watch this, um, turn, um, make a bookmark for this, consume this, versus the other end of that horizontal line which is about reputation. So how much are you talking about what you offer as a channel, what your brand essence is? Why do audiences love you? Why do you have fans? What is it that you are doing that, that, that are building those fans? Um, and when we do this exercise, just really want you to think about your marketing activities in your own media. So we're not thinking about your content mix, not necessarily thinking about your bigger pays, media campaigns but if I was to sit and consume your channel or service for I don't know two or three weeks and be exposed to all those marketing messages that you're throwing at me where would I think your main focus is okay so we're going to do plot three things three points on this chart okay so the first point you need to put on here is where do you think your marketing focus is now okay so just to explain that it might be that very much of your focus from an on-air point of view it's all about tune in this week tune in next week it's about driving viewing and you're very much focusing on those loyal viewers that are on your channel and if that's the case then you put your your point in that bottom left hand corner there 
Okay. Um, it might be the opposite. It might be we, we talk very much about reputation, about um, our brand, and we're really trying to constantly talk to those really light viewers that maybe only come in uh, once or twice a month in order to, to um, get them to become more loyal viewers to the channel. And if that's the case, then where you are now would be in that top right hand corner. So just think about where you are now. And then the next cross to point is um, put on here is your biggest competitor, if you look at their marketing, so you're not looking at their content, but their marketing and the way they market their content, where would you put them on this chart? Okay, are they very sort of close to where you are? Or actually, do you think they do things a bit differently? Where would you mark them? And then the third point is the important one. So looking at where you are now and what your main competitor is doing, where do you think you want to be? Okay, what should the mix of your marketing be in terms of making sure that you um, keeping those loyal viewers with you versus how important is it to also be marketing to those lighter viewers? How important is it to be focusing on viewing versus reputation? And interestingly, that exercise we just done around brand health would probably influence how much reputation you need to do. If you come out with a really high score on the brand health exercise, then it may be actually you don't need to be doing much of a job in terms of reputation because you are you have a very healthy brand and it can be more about supporting the content and just driving consumption. Whereas if you had a lower score on the previous exercise, then actually you might want to think about, OK, we need to do more reputation into that mix. Uh, and when we talk about reputation in, in terms of uh, your owned media support, don't don't just think of the differentiation between just tuning messages and big brand pieces. You know, we all recognize that big brand pieces can cost and they're not, um, they're not something that everybody can do, but maybe it's about how you market yourself regarding reputation as opposed to what is the actual message itself. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a, there's a, there's a subtlety in terms of that, but you know, the claims you make about content as opposed to just tuning at nine o'clock on a Tuesday. Um, so it doesn't have to be just about big brand uh, pieces on your, on your services. Okay. So hopefully you've all. Okay. I was going to say, um, one of the questions that we sometimes get asked is, is what is the, what is the right position? Should, is, should it be over there? Is that where we all sort of aspiring to get to, or should it be over there? What, I mean, what are you, your yeah, opinions that, on that? That's a really good question. And, and there is a little bit of a life cycle um, to, to this chart. And I think a really good example to answer that question, Joe, is um, we did this exercise in, um, in another part of the world and we had two broadcasters in the room um, I can probably name the broadcasters. One was Sony and one was BBC. Um, and Sony had some very strong channel brands and their focus was very much in the bottom left-hand corner. So all their marketing on, on air is about talking to their loyal viewers and it was about watch, 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 watch. And then we had BBC who were very new entrants into that market and had some very new channels. So they didn't even have loyal viewers. So they were very much in that top right-hand corner they had light viewers that they needed to grow in to become loyal viewers. And just to really establish their credentials in those markets, they had to do very much more around their reputation and build that brand um, in order to get the success that, that Sony had had. So they were in that top right hand corner. So you almost find sort of younger brands are maybe a lot more in that top right hand corner very um, established brands are down in the left hand corner, but you need to be careful because it's always the, the world is always changing around you. So even though you may have a strong brand and you can focus on that bottom right hand corner, if things externally, the landscape starts to change, your competitors start to do things differently, then you may need to think about, okay, well, where should I move myself? Do I need to move myself a bit more into the middle? But there's no absolute right or wrong. It is up totally down to what you're trying to do as a, as a, as a channel and a service, how your audiences view you, what are your what what was your future objectives as well and that's partly why we did that exercise right at the beginning to almost do the framework about thinking about where am I now where do I need to be in the future because again that should influence where you are plotting where your third point on here as to where you want to be yeah so it's the journey the journey that you need to go on is more important than where you are now yeah 
So I think we've probably spent enough time on this chart now, but the, in essence, what you should, most of you will probably have, not maybe everyone, you have a gap. You have a gap between where you are now and that's that third point you pointed to where you want to be. And that gap is the really important part. So if it is moving maybe from the bottom left into the middle, then from a marketing point of view, it's like, okay, well, we need to start thinking about how we dial up more of our marketing, which is talking to those lighter viewers and maybe pull back less from the loyal viewers. And the mix of marketing messages needs to change for maybe not so much just about viewing, but how we bring that kind of reputation message into that as well. Anyway, let's move on to the, the fourth and final exercise. Yeah. Alan? So, so we've, we've talked about brand a lot. We've talked about um, the likes of, of revenue and the factors that that dictate your strategy. But obviously one thing we've not talked a huge amount about is actually the content yourself because realistically you're only as sort of strong as the content that you've got um, that you can offer to your to your viewers, to your consumers, whether that be in the um, linear world or the, the VOD world. Um, so, so basically, we talk about this content pipeline and understanding the differing roles for your content we feel as though is important in terms of how you promote that. So again, quite often, you, going back to one of those early charts that Joe showed in terms of the demands from say marketing versus programming versus sales, they're all very valid in terms of um, what people expect. However, the recognition sometimes of what certain pieces of content can do for your audiences and for your business is sometimes overlooked. So we, li we like to address um, the next chart. And Joe, if you can move on. Uh, in terms of, um, and click please. Yeah, in, in terms of plotting our content, and once again, do this for channel for, for portfolio, it's probably easier to do for a, a, a channel in terms of plotting where my content is in terms of these four grids. So some of you may recognize this as being the Boston consultancy model. So I've got two axes here. The vertical axis is about image enhancing. So what content enhances my image, my channel image, my portfolio image, for a better word, my brand image. You know, some pieces of content you know are out there in terms of, yeah, you're highly associated with it and it brings huge, great brand kudos to your channels. Other content, less so. And on the horizontal axis, you've got consumption. So whether that be viewing in linear or consumption in VOD as well. You've obviously got very, very high levels of, of consumption for some programs, other programs less. So we've carved it up into four sort of areas here. And let me go around I'll start with a star in the top right hand corner and explain uh, what that is. So everybody loves a star. So star content, what it is, it, it achieves very high levels of viewing consumption, and it is also very good from a brand perspective for that channel, that service that you've actually got. We all love stars. However, in reality, we've probably got as many, we, we've probably not got as many stars as we probably feel as though number one we need but secondly that we probably think we have stars can very very quickly particularly in this very changing and quick changing world of ours stars can very quickly drop down into into the bottom right hand corner there which is cash cows cash cows are great cash cows have still got high viewing volume cash cows are probably more important to say the advertising world and the sales world than they are probably to marketing um, in, in terms of they are still critically important because they bring in revenue. However, they are not so new now. They could be maybe in season three, season four, season five, season six, maybe. And they've lost their shine. They're not as shiny. They're not as much a must watch uh, as they once were when maybe they're actually a star. I'm then going to go to the top left hand corner. You've got two question marks up there. And the reason why you've got two question marks is because we probably feel as though there were two different types of content here. One is about probably new content. So new content that comes into your channel, comes into your service. Nobody actually knows how well that is going to perform. Everybody's obviously got the very highest um, 
opinions of it and the highest hopes of it, but nobody knows what it's going to de actually deliver. So therefore, it always remains to be a question mark. We all hope it's going to move over to the right-hand side to become a star and to go for that cycle. Unfortunately, some of them don't do that and some of them drop down below, which I'm just going to explain in a second. The other question mark, and I think this is possibly more important for, say, factual, even public service channels in some markets, is content that's on your channel that is never really going to deliver very high levels of ratings, okay, or viewing. However, from a brand point of view, it's critical content. And the content, and the, so the channel would be worse off and less thought of if that content actually wasn't on that channel. You'd promote them in very, very different ways, certainly in terms of weights and, uh, and length maybe, but those are, those are critical uh, differences between those two pieces of content. Now, the bottom left-hand corner, that poor muck there, that poor dog there, um, that's the dog corner, which is content which is not only um, short of viewers in terms of not, great, not very high levels of viewing, but also probably does nothing for your brand as well. In an ideal world, you wouldn't promote that content. Sometimes you may be forced internally for certain reasons to do it, but ideally you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't want to do that. So... What I'd like you to do is just to spend a few minutes trying to maybe put in uh, two programs into each section. And ideally, if you've got question marks, you might do two for each or certainly one for each. Each section in terms of what are the, ca what are the stars in your, in your business? What are the cash cows? What are the question marks? And I, so, I suppose, um, what are the dogs as well? But maybe you've got no dogs or hopefully you've got no dogs that you actually support for that. So if we just spend two, two minutes doing that and, um, and hopefully be very, very truthful in terms of where your content is. And for me, the biggest difference or the biggest, most difficult thing to do is between your stars and your cash cows. So those programs that you look upon and the business looks upon as a star is it really a star? Is it as shiny as it once was? Just because it still does very high levels of viewing, is it a star? Is it in danger of tipping into a cash cow? And similarly, cash cows, are they still big? Are they still delivering the ratings? Yeah. And just to be clear, it's not the, the cash cow is, is, is a good, Great. Absolutely. Is a good thing to have um, mm. because it is still driving viewing for you. And actually for a lot of channels, maybe yeah. sort of 60 to 70% of their view may come from these cash cows. So yeah. the, it's just about the role of marketing for these different types of content will be very different. Yeah. A cash cow, you don't need to put as much effort into marketing it as, as you do a star because you want to keep your star shiny and gleamy for as long as possible. So you want to put a lot of effort into that. And equally, from a marketing point of view, the, the question marks, the new question marks content, which is new to you, it, uh, uh, you really need to put as much marketing as, as you can behind that because you want to drive it round this quadrant, these quadrants, if you like, for it to make it that, that next star. Yeah, we when well, just just when you're finishing off this exercise, I'll just give you an example that we quite often uh, use when we explain this. So I'm sure everybody's uh, familiar with Big Brother, love it or hate it. Uh, when Big Brother launched here in the UK, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, maybe even longer. Um, because of that time, um, it was very new reality programming it certainly started off as a as a question mark this is on channel four in the uk which is the third largest commercial channel sorry third largest largest channel second largest commercial channel and it very very quickly became a star you know it was very good in terms of fulfilling channel four's brand proposition it also did very high levels of viewing and it stayed a star for probably about four seasons okay but soon there were other reality programs that were competing with that 
uh, and it had lost its shine a little tiny bit, but it still did high levels of viewing. It became a cash cow. It stayed there for probably about another three seasons. However, then it became tarnished because of the activities of going, what was going on. It became dated as well because of new innovations inside of that content market inside of the UK as well. And it eventually became a dog for probably two seasons and Channel 4 binned that program. So that just gives you an understanding of the life stage of your content. I think that's probably enough time for that chart. So mm -hmm. why, don't, why don't we move on and we're coming to, to, to the conclusion now. Yeah, can I just say one last thing on this yeah. chart? So looking at how, how much content you have in each of these quadrants is also important. So if mm. you have a lot of cash cows, um, and very few stars, then what you need to do in your marketing would be different from if you have lots of stars and question marks. So thinking about your pipeline as well, what you have coming through, is it gonna feed each of these quadrants evenly or are you gonna have some weaknesses in some quadrants going forward um, will then help to identify, okay, well, I need to do something in my marketing to almost plug that gap until I can, can fill it up. But let me move on. Yeah. So, so basically that, those are, are, those are the four main exercises before we sort of put, put it all together now. And this, this goes back to one of those earlier charts. So we'd like to feel as though we've, we've segmented your, um, your channels, your services, your corporation in terms of the brand health. We've tried to highlight, uh, those changing factors, whether that be about where your revenue is going to come from in the future, as opposed to now, who are your audiences going to be or what you need to do with those audiences to make, to make sure you future proof those very audience, though that, that very revenue, to be perfectly honest, the content we've tried to, um, we've tried to position your content. Quite often we, we work with broadcasters that have been very, very successful in the past. However, they haven't moved quickly enough in terms of their content streams or with the innovation of that content to be able to keep up to date. So therefore, they mature much, much quicker than their competitors or much, much quicker than they actually should do. So recognizing, you know, what you want to, your content to stand for, how you position that, and also the life stage of that content is critical to back up the future as well. You know, going back to that chart Joe showed earlier, you plan the future, you don't plan for the future. So that the future starts here is, 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 is quite critical. And brand perception was that final one there as well in terms of once you understand how people think about you, you know how to address the weaknesses and to uh, exploit the strengths. So the final sort of thing we sort of want you to do here is hopefully you've been making notes as you've, as you've gone through and maybe you've circled some things as Joe sort of uh, highlighted and it would be nice to think that we've given you some ideas to think about in terms of where you are and maybe where you should be going. And I'll come back to that point I said before, you know, our business is all about working with broadcasters exclusively to help them to, to, to best use their biggest marketing tool they've got, which is their owned media support, wherever that be linear, wherever that be VOD, wherever that be their own organic social in effect as well. So just spend a couple of minutes thinking, what are the things I need to possibly to do more of or change and maybe what are the things that I need to change in terms of being doing less of as well that could be about a, a campaign imbalance that could be a, a service imbalance that could be about less focus in terms of viewing and more on reputation every broadcaster is going to be so so different in terms of uh, how they need to sort of change for 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 the future um, so we can either do, do that exercise now and give you a, a little tiny bit of time, um, or obviously by all means take it back to, to the office and do that and think long and hard going back over your, your charts as well. How are we doing for time? I think, I think we should move on actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the final, the final thing, so what, what we've tried to do, Joe, do you wanna to go to the final shot? Mm -hmm. what, what, what we've tried to do is bring up, um, is to highlight the tasks that you need to do as a business to going back to the title of this, of this, uh, of this session, which is about future proofing your audiences and future proofing your, your revenue. And you could say 
one one in they're, they're one one and the same. However, you can't just do that. Um, you know, bit by bit, you you've got to highlight what are those tasks you've got to do. And that leads us to what we call and what we use in our business called task led marketing. Okay. So what are the, what, you know, what is it I want to do? Okay. And therefore you have a clear understanding of what I need to do to fulfill that task. And you'll have lots of different tasks uh, across, across the board, whether it be about viewership, extending reach, changing perception, or many, many more as well. So we probably say the next three or, or three critical steps in terms of getting to that task-led marketing uh, would be to make sure that your owned media allocation uh, of, of, of your resources is, is, is allocated, particularly inside of a portfolio, allocated correctly to be able to do that. So, you know, quite often we see probably channels that don't need huge levels of promotion uh, disproportionately getting uh, too much levels. Um, sometimes we're seeing not enough support from linear towards VOD services as well. So therefore, make sure that's key. You then need a prioritization framework. And this is just a very simple one that's on the right-hand side here in terms of how do you recognize that different pieces of content are able to tick box the different tasks that you may need to do from a marketing point of view. And once you, you do that, you can then apply the media planning science. So creating an actual campaign model, which we talk about, which is actually rooted in media science. Now that's the numbers, which we're not going to actually get going to go in today. You can see there, I've called that, that task growth campaign and growth in this instance is probably more about extending reach than actually growing volume but you treat that task of growth very very different to say a task of um, maximizing viewing because you almost need to do one before you do the other so that that's that's an awful lot more work there but it gives you the steps hopefully of taking forward where you need to get to in terms of being able to um, to fulfill the exercises we've gone through to and then to obviously take that forward into what we call task leg marketing and I think that's the final chart yep. today. So we would love um, some questions fed through, which hopefully Jojo and myself can answer for you. Are we ending over to you, Andy? Yeah, thank you for the very enlightening uh, presentation. Um, audience, if you have any question now, now is the time to put it in under the Q&A section. Um, in the meantime, we do have a question that came in from emails. Uh, it probably make more sense to you than me. It's, uh, so the question is, if a central prioritizing, prioritization approach currently doesn't exist, how do you go about introducing one? Okay. Do you want to say that, Joe, or shall I? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's a good question. And obviously, all the exercises we've done today, you can, you can do within your marketing teams. But if you're able to get a, a broader set of stakeholders in the room, then you perhaps may get some bigger impact and you can think about what those broader objectives are for the business. Um, so I would, I would just sort of encourage you to, to highlight the benefits of, of, of all putting together and, and being streamlined in our thinking so everyone's pulling in the same direction. Because I think as a business, you can, you can be a lot more efficient in terms of what you're doing from an output point of view, you can use your resources more effectively and ultimately you, you can you can you can do better it's better marketing and, and you can do that if you're all working together so i think it's about efficiency in terms of your media resource and also from a from a from a staff point of view as well it, it, it's also it's, it's removing some of those boundaries from within a uh, a broadcast that quite often comes up in terms of everybody wants an a priority or a gold or a gold priority and what we what we try to do in terms of the task led marketing is um, remove that hierarchical approach that can sometimes I think take broadcasters down the wrong path in terms of when they're when they're prioritizing their content and and quite often if that person shouts they want that that person shouts they want that before long you've got a huge amount of uh, pieces of content being supported You've, your promotional inventory remains the same. So you end up almost deprioritizing than prioritizing. So 
this sort of central market approach is quite radical or quite rigid in ensuring that you've got an absolute efficient and effective model in place to be able to deliver the tasks and they are done from a business point of view as opposed to let's say from a personal point of view or purely just because it sort of exists well, thank you joe um and alan um rajika do you have any question uh, on your side yeah there's one more question uh, why do you think brand health is so important JW? Um, I would say, well, I think we would all say that brand health is even more important today than it has ever been in the past, purely just because of the way the market has changed and we've got so many more players in the market. There is so much more content and content that might be shared between different um, portfolios as well that stamping your brand around that content is the one way of signposting to audiences who you are, what you stand for. And particularly when we get into the world of video and demand, where we're seeing, if you think of sort of Amazon and Netflix, the, the hours and hours of content that lives on there, you want people to attribute content back to your brand. So having that strong brand is, is increasingly important, almost like a signposting when you go in there, what do I want to watch? Oh, here you go. There's some content from this brand that I know and I trust. Wow, I'm going to go and explore there first rather than all these hundreds of other different options that I've got here. Um, so that would be one of the main reasons why we think brand is important. Yeah, we, we, we feel strong, strong brands are going to win out at the end, basically. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they need to be the biggest brands. It's those that with the strongest identity and brand health. Excellent. In fact, your four key drivers were very interesting to hear. So, okay. yeah, we've got a question from Robert Middleton. He asked, how many times does a viewer need to see a spot to convert them over? And how do you know? Rob, how many times have we answered this question for you? <laughs> um, it, it's, uh, for, for us, it's, it's, a, it's it, it, it is obviously a very, very, tricky thing to do but if you've got the right target audience you're not going to sell um what's the phrase you're not going to sell sell oil to, to to the arabs or or or, or the like so so for us the task-led marketing and the segmentation of audiences we do is making sure that you've actually got the right content for the right audiences to make a difference it is much, much more difficult to convert something, somebody with new content um, than with, with already established content. So our, the models we build are very much based around frequency in terms of doing more of a task for uh, new content against the right target audiences than we do for, for more established content. Yeah, um, I'd say that's exactly where the media science comes in too. Yes. You can look at historically what's worked, then then also, yeah, you look at, okay, we need different levels of frequencies depending on the different jobs we need to do. Yeah. Higher frequencies yeah. for new content, lower frequencies for yeah. established content. Uh, 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 and yeah, that media science is, is in there. And, and I, think, I think you'd have to spend many millions of, of whatever currency in terms of econometric modeling to get that absolutely right. And I've, I've never seen one yet. So you're giving your best chance in terms of making sure you get the right level of communication against that right target audience. Sometimes we see many broadcasters focusing on what they call their commercial audience. So that could be, I don't know, 16 to 49s or 18 to 54s. But inside of that, you've got so many different segments OK, that in that situation, if you're just targeting your weight against that commercial audience, what you're likely to do is is over communicate against your heavy audiences and under communicate against those lighter audiences, which are the ones that you actually want to do. So segmentation of audiences for the right content and making sure you get the right communication against that specific audience, whether it's a 16 to 24, 16 to 30, 16 to 34, whatever, is the critical aspect. So you can't just it's not broad brushstrokes. It really is segmentation of audiences. And I think that's more and more as well in terms of VOD um, as well, how they integrate those models. You know, television is still the way where you maximize reach. Quite often, VOD and 
of the web is where you create that frequency as well and the two go hand in hand thank you, thank you. Uh, i think we are running out of time yeah uh, thank you alan james joe wilkinson and joe goddard uh, thank you the audience for being here with us today we hope you enjoyed this week webinar. If you have any suggestion or comment, uh, email to webinar at promaxasia.tv. We are taking a break next week as again on 23rd of July as we kick off our webinar series, Exceptionally Asia, where we spotlight an Asia country in each episode. Until next time, take care and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye.